So we now move on to any agenda adjustment um, by any commissioners. Uh, any commissioners have an agenda adjustment at this point? Not you, Christy? It's your last day. <laughs> Oh, um, now it's time we can move on to approving our previous meeting minutes. At every uh, meeting, our secretary takes notes. Those notes are called minutes. Every month, minutes are included in our packet. We review them and approve them to the following month, and that is always part of the agenda. Any adjustment to the minutes? Can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Um, I move to approve the minutes for my January meeting. All in favor? I second the motion. Oh, sorry. All in favor? And that brings us up to item four which is community participation. Do I speak loud enough? Is that okay? Yes, thank you, thank you. Sure, sure. Sorry. Slides a little too fast, too soon. Um, Ingrid, do you want me to screen share the slides? Would that help? Uh, I think we're good. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. For community participation, members of the public join our meetings and contribute. They have three minutes to share, and staff has time to respond. Community members can sign sign up in advance. And Reed, has anyone signed up to speak? I did not receive any requests for to sign up to speak. However, we do have a request from a community member who's asking if commissioners will introduce themselves. Sure. Should I start? Yes. My name is John, and uh, I go by JH. And I'm the chair of the commission for now. Hi, my name is Carlos. Uh, I'm the vice uh, chair of the commission. Hi, I'm Picker, um, and I've been a part of the HRC for two years, almost now. My name is Anna, and I was part of the HRC for one year, last year. Um, my name is Christine Chen, and I've been part of the HRC for three years, and um, this evening is my final meeting. Thank you. Um, we There is a, a couple of people from staff who are present at this meeting. My name is Ingrid Pesto. And I uh, serve as the city liaison. And um, Maida is not assigned as an interpreter. So she can. Um, one moment, please. Um, so I'll pause uh, the meeting for a moment. Our interpreters have a request. Maida is not.
Thank you. We had a short permission on language access. Program manager is confirming with the interpreters that everything is set. And um, I did get a request from a community member who would like to speak. I'll go ahead and um, grant them access right away. Mark. Can you Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. We have, uh, two minutes, and I will be uh, timing uh, you right now. Okay, thanks. Hello, commissioners, um, and Elizabeth and Elena. Um, I, uh, my name is Mark Fuhrer, and I am a member of the Tenant Advisory Committee of uh, the Eviction Protection and uh, Rental Assistance Services, or EPRIS, which hopefully you all are familiar with, but I'm not sure if you are. Um, I'm also a member of, uh, I'm a resident commissioner of the Board of Commissioners for Boulder Housing Partners. So I'm speaking in these capacities, but not on behalf of either one of these bodies. Um, and I'm speaking tonight uh, and also, I'm a longtime tenant activist, and I have addressed this group, I think it was a couple of years ago. Uh, I can't quite remember. It was mostly on the issue of rent control and tenant issues, for those who might remember. And uh, just a little rem reminder of the history of the HRC. The HRC used to uh, deal quite extensively with tenant issues back in the 1980s when I was director of the Boulder Tenants Union. Often the city council would refer uh, issues to the HRC so the city council wouldn't have to deal with them when it came to tenant issues. So tonight I'm asking you um, um, to see if there's a way to perhaps collaborate between the different uh, groups that I've mentioned, uh, Board of uh, BHP and, and the Tenant Advisory Committee on the issue of tenant issues. Um, we are looking, we, um, the Tenant Advisory Committee is looking to expand its role. Right now we focus uh, primarily on evictions and protecting tenants in that capacity, um, but we're looking to expand uh, our uh, role to dealing with additional tenant protection issues in the city of Boulder. Um, Thank you, Mark. Your time is okay. up. Okay. Any responses from commissioners? Part of that is, is like, uh, I know Mark only has two minutes. He needed to finish the last thing he was going to say. So he said he's part of the uh, Boulder Housing. Which one is it again? I was taking notes when he was over. Tenant Advisory Committee. Tenant Advisory. His question didn't finish. He didn't say how we can collaborate to help him. I don't know how to do it. So if he can, if he is that okay to give him one more minute to just explain what does it mean to collaborate? Because I think there are more than that to say. Um, um I think I have an alternate suggestion. I can maybe fill in a little bit of blanks because I work with the Senate Advisory Committee. Um and um maybe Mark could just share in the in the chat. Um, if that sounds good, we can facilitate all sorts of next steps. Um, the one <clears throat> option is that if the HRC is interested in hearing more from the committee, um, we could work with the um, committee chair and have someone attend the, their next meeting. Um, they have quarterly meetings. Um, you can have ask Mark or um, other members of the Ten Advisory Committee to come in April and hear a little bit more about what they do and um, what some of the options are there. I think it would be difficult to kind of use a public comment um, forum to have a conversation. And what I believe he's asking for is just to see if the HRC is interested in having a conversation, kind of hearing more about where the advisory committee um, is at, what they're working on, and um, just to see if there's any potential for communication or collaboration. And Mark will let me know if that's uh, incorrect. 
I'll always wait to see what he says. He he just put something like Chris angry. So he put something like. Um, Mark, go ahead. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, oh, great. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to uh, intrude on your agenda. Uh, and I, I didn't mean to have a, any kind of uh, lengthy conversation tonight with you, but rather just raise the issue. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure exactly how or what, what it would look like to collaborate. Uh, I just know the need is there to strengthen protections for tenants, which make up uh, about 53% of the population of Boulder. And it was, a human relations commission issue long ago, I still think it is. And beyond that, I'm again, very hesitant to take up any more of your time on it. I'm, I'm planting a seed and hope we could uh, talk further on this issue. Thank you, Mark. I also send you um, a message um, and I'll remind community members that you can reach the human relations commission via email as well. To follow up with comments. I, I'm interested in to know more about this. Me too. I won't personally con connect even with the enterprising issues. Personal issue. Yeah, me too. Oh, yeah, I think it's good. But we all of us. Even Chris, uh, Christine is living, I believe she will still be mm -hmm. hmm? there. <laughs> well, I think it's, it will be a good conversation to have, but I don't know. Usually, um, you guys know we can't, I think that's correct. We do the way we wrote it is uh, we can't have meetings more than two people, correct? Correct. Yeah, so we need to be extremely you know, careful of that until. But I think it's something it's worth exploring to see. And I think um, with us being so young in the HRC and without anybody that's uh, been on it for too long, you know, I'm probably the most senior here. I don't think I know as much, but the fact that he brings that to say in the 80s, I think it's a, it's a conversation that's worth having to make sure that, you know, uh, we can move forward with that. So. Is there anybody else there, uh, Ingrid? I'm sorry? Is there anybody else there? No one else has requested for yeah. Now, is that correct, Christian? Should I take note? We move on to our uh, items. Now we are on the part of, part of the meeting where uh, we have a discussion and informational items. As a reminder, we do need to vote, but I invite you all to participate. Is that correct? You want the right thing? Angry. During action items. Okay. That, that just means that whatever the discussion is, it may be something that we'll need to, you'll need to vote on in order to okay. make a decision or advance. May I? Sure. Okay. Um, I guess my first question is, is there any way I can get on to the Wi-Fi? Um, yeah. is, is it? It should be connected. Connect I was trying. But it'll, it should pop up a little, you know, you got to accept the, the terms and conditions. Accept the terms. You need to open a new tab? Probably. Okay. It's like showing that I'm. Yeah, you can peek. Yeah. I think it's. I want to turn it on. Yeah, I mean, I did share it with you, yeah. so if I'm you can share your screen. Okay, that, we can do it that way. Okay. Um, I have it open. Well, I'll go ahead and start speaking. Um, so I think, um, as, as you all know, City Council has invited all boards and commissions to uh, 
provide any kind of feedback or issues to raise before they have their annual retreat, which I think is coming up pretty soon. And so um, I took the liberty of drafting a letter from all of us and uh, hopefully you all received it from me last week individually and hopefully you had a chance to look at it. Um, I heard from back from a couple of you that you were happy with where the letter was, but I added a few things this morning. So I wanted to go through those and make sure that everybody um, feels that they can get behind this letter. And if there's any edits we need to do, we can also spend the next you know, several minutes working on them. Um, the gist of this letter it reflects some of the issues that I raised um, in my resignation letter to city council last month, um, namely that I think that they should prioritize reform of all boards and commissions and how they work. Um, and I'll just I'll just run through this paragraph by paragraph. Actually, before I do that, let me ask: Does anyone have any questions or feedback on a previous draft that you may have seen? No. Okay. Okay. So um, the just this, the first two three paragraphs I edited a little bit. First of all, um, I, to thank them for the opportunity to provide feedback. And then I added a new second paragraph because I wanted to acknowledge that there are many issues that we have raised as priorities in the past and that we still think they are priorities, but we also recognize city council also thinks that they're priorities. For example, homelessness, um, for example, all the issues around uh, police oversight in the last two or three years that have you know, not been resolved very quickly and we've we've made it clear to city council that we don't think that's gone very well um and i think there's been an acknowledgement from them that not to us specifically but to the city at large that uh could have been better um but i just wanted to to put that in there to acknowledge that there are other issues beyond um the reform of boards and commissions so i wanted to ask anybody all of you to see if there is anything else we would like to add to that. If you want to take a minute and just read the second paragraph. You need me to sub submit zoom in. If anybody wants to add something we can discuss or if we want to leave it as is, that's also fine. Amen. Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> Do you, does anyone need a little more time for the second paragraph? I think it's good. Okay. 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 Um, all right. Then um, on the third paragraph, um, I also added a sentence to acknowledge that there already is work going on to look at boards and commissions um, because I wanted to acknowledge this is on some people's minds, but really the main issue is that we think they need to prioritize it more and speed it up more. So, um, but otherwise that paragraph is largely the same. So I'll give you a minute to make sure you're okay with that. Yeah. Okay, I see nods, all right. If you could keep going down a little bit. Um, you know, there, there were a few categories here. I think I've made no changes there. Um, I've made no changes there. If you could keep on going to the next highlighted, uh, highlighted section. Um, so one of the things I wanted to note for city council is, um, as they bring on new members of all boards and commissions that they not only look into diversity of experiences, but also diversity of skill set. And so I highlighted that sometimes it can be uneven, um, this is something they should consider looking into. So that's just one additional sentence I added. I see nods, okay, <laughs> we can keep going. Um, and then uh, here, I I really, 
I, I didn't want to say that HRC necessarily thinks we should be a bigger commission with shorter terms, but that they should consider consider looking at that. So I softened that a little bit too. Um, and those are all the changes I've made since uh, last Friday. Um, um, can, can you make sure I spelled speaker's name right this time? <laughs> I know that. That's fair. I, I think think it's it's right. Okay. Um, so I think if everybody feels good about this, uh, JH, you're probably yeah, a chair. Right. I'm feeling so a little good about it. Yes, yeah. chair, you should probably call. I, I thought I responded to your email on su Sunday, though. I don't know why, but I, <laughs> because I read it 10 times, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was hoping it would be pretty quick, but it looks like it is quick. But I do think we probably ought to vote. So I will make a motion since <laughs> I'm not the chair. I move that we um, approve this letter and finalize it and send it to city council after this meeting. I second that. Yes. All in favor? Yeah, we should. It's a good letter and thank you for saying it. Uh, yeah. uh, I was thinking of sending one as well, but you you were way for a hair. Yeah. I'll also add, I think when we have commissioner updates, I'll, I'll tell you more, but I, I also met with a couple of members of city council about this too, and they were very receptive. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. As for one quick clarification, are you planning on sending that directly or do you need or want Ingrid or I to forward them out? Um, either option. If you want to forward it, that would be great. We just need to remove the yellow highlights and that's okay. it. Got it. Consider it done. Thank you. Oh, now we are moving on to the staff update. Right. Oh, discussion oh, information. Oh, slide. Discussion. oh, how did I miss that? Oh, sorry. Now we are at the part of meeting where we have discussion and additional information items. As a reminder, we did not need to vote, but I invite you all to participate open. <laughs> um, and Ingrid, can you enable screen sharing for me? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, we do have, as you uh, can see, in the agenda, an update on minimum wage. Uh, do you remember um, that in the past, we have the pleasure of having Taylor Raymond uh, presenting um, an overview of the minimal um, wages uh, status in the timeline. And today, uh, Taylor is here to provide you with an update. Oops. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Liz, I think I have some. Yeah, well, you can do it. Oh, there you go. Um, hi, everyone. Again, nice to see you all. Uh, Taylor Ryman, she, her pronouns. And I believe I was with y'all last October. Mm -hmm. Yeah, October. Um, just to share that this was happening and we were moving into some next steps. Um, this is actually work that has happened since May of 2022. So we're almost, this project is almost two years old. Um, it took a long time to build support across the county to get us to where we are right now. But this is the exciting time because we are engaging with community members to see how they feel. And I, it's almost in exactly halfway between our engagement window right now. So I wanted to come and share an update about how engagement is going, um, what we're hearing, what we have planned after engagement and what the sort of the full process looks like. Um, I have a little video to share just to start us off. Oh, you know what? I totally didn't share with sound.
Belmont, Lafayette, and Louisville and the town of Erie are working together to consider a regional minimum wage. In 2024, this team of cities are engaging community members in the conversation and working with a consultant to conduct an economic analysis. Over the next few months, community members are invited to share their feedback through the survey or attend one of the many sessions that will be hosted in person and virtually across these five cities. It's that's terrible. Um, I'm just gonna pause it for a second and see if we get some buffer. And let's try again. Owe it to our community to explore every avenue available to make our cities places for all to thrive. Minimum wage is one of those avenues, and we are eager to begin exploring this with our partners, side by side with the communities that are most impacted. The small businesses are the backbone of our community. Therefore, we must find a balance that allows them to attract and retain employees who deserve to earn a living wage while also maintaining the economic viability of those businesses. All the chambers should be at the table. All the businesses within those communities that want to participate should be at the table. All single parents that want to participate should be at the table. We want our community to continue to thrive. The minimum wage is an important part of maintaining these qualities of life, but it's important that we understand all impacts of our decisions on all stakeholders. We can't do it without your help. So please participate in this assessment by sharing your thoughts and opinions. Your input will help regional leaders make an important decision about this topic. A new minimum wage would not be implemented before January of 2025. Please visit the link on your screen for ways to add your voice to the discussion. Thank you for making the time to share your perspective on this topic that is so important for our community. Okay, sorry, the audio was good. The video, the visuals, the visuals were terrible. Um, and I just show that too, I think it helps highlight um, the uniqueness of this project and the way that we're approaching it. It's not uncommon for cities to work together on things, but for us, our five cities to be coming together to work on an issue like minimum wage in the way that we're doing it by partnering to, for a consultant analysis, by doing like a shared model of community engagement that's implemented uniquely in each community based on their needs. Um, it's, it's really uh, an incredible collaboration project. And Should have asked for Ingrid's expert help on this, but I got it. So since we met in October, <laughs> since we met in October, representatives from all of the organizations on this screen have been meeting to um, create the for both the consultant analysis that is happening right now, um, as well as the community engagement model that we have that, like created as a standard and are being uniquely implemented um, in each city. Make sure you're me. We have a little uh, audio. Test, test. Okay, test, okay. test. Should you be muted?
Yeah, I couldn't hear anything. It's like okay. the sound got turned off. Can you test now, Elena? I'm having difficulties with audio again. Um, it's a lifestyle choice. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just confirm. Okay, we're good. I got the thumbs up. Uh, Taylor, I can share the screen. Um, I just need to, because I think they might be catching some audio from there. Am I eating too loudly? <laughs> I'll back up. Or can you try again, share it without audio? Uh, yes. Thank you. We have a little under a month left until the engagement window closes. And we have in Boulder, we have three more sessions planned so folks can come and join in person and share their thoughts about what they think about this. We've been fra um, framing sessions as community sessions or business sessions. Anybody can go to anything, but it's just helpful to do that framing because um, sometimes business owners wouldn't share things if they knew that there were like customers or or employees around and and vice versa. There's like maybe some power dynamics that kind of come into play in those environments. Um, and it's just helpful also from a facilitation standpoint of like capturing feedback and managing conversations. But anybody can come to any session. Uh, <clears throat> Longmont has hosted 12 sessions so far. And they have one more planned over the next month. And then, like I said, that questionnaire remains available. It's about a five minute questionnaire. Um, part of why I'm coming and, and sharing this with you is because I'm really looking to the commissioners um, and honestly, everybody I've been able to get the ear of over the last month uh, to help us spread the word and let people know um, that this engagement opportunity is available. Um, the more voices that join the conversation, the better. Um, one of the things that we noticed from a very early session was that uh, it was the first session and it was business, sort of business focused session. And there was a lot of downtown businesses represented. We partnered with the Chamber of Commerce to do that. You know, um, noticing that gap, we have tried to be responsive. And so we have put together a team of people who are going out um, in person and walking up to businesses and talking to folks, whether it's the manager or an employee and directly sharing that this opportunity is available. I actually just ran into Carlos today because I was in North Boulder doing business canvassing and I looked up and there he was. <laughs> so um, it's actually been really great for me too to get to know um, the community. And you know, some folks are like, why is the government here? And some folks are like, wow, we really appreciate you coming out to us. So it's been a good opportunity um, to just build relationships. Um, and over the last week that we've been doing this, we've made contact with over 150 businesses in person. Now, how that translates to, are people actually showing up to focus group sessions? Are people actually filling out questionnaire is a different story, but making contact um, that in-person contact, I think those really, um, for letting folks know, um, that we care about, um, their opinion. Um, so we're, we're chatting with you today. We're also chatting with, um, the Boulder County Consortium of Cities, which is where all of these conversations originally started, um, on April 3rd. And we'll be sharing with council members that represent all five cities a similar update like we are doing right now um, about how things are going. Um, and then looking ahead, which I have a visual to show you. In time. Sorry, intermission. That's my computer desk one. Um, is, is that the whole presentation? It's not. And I just didn't show the page one. Yeah, I have like a whole presentation. Mm -hmm. No. Is this the one, one of the ones that you want to show? Uh, it's well, just on the mm -hmm. website. Ingrid, if you can go to, um, the um, minimum wage web page on the city web page. There's a graphic in English and in Spanish about halfway down. 
Yeah, so we could show that. I get the rest of it. And I think I need to be re promoted to co host. Give me just one second because it's not. I also need to make it a list. Co host. I have a sharing this screen right now. Oh, I'm I am ready. So I'm gonna we'll share this web link with everybody so yes. you have all the information. This is what wages are right now in the state of Colorado. Um, it's a visual representation um, just to help folks out because there are a couple of communities in the state that have lifted minimum wage above the state level, but uh, several have not. So the Denver was the first to do this and they raised theirs to $15 an hour back in 2019. Since then it's been escalating slightly each year for inflation, so now it's 18.29. Um, and then Edgewater just last year passed a new minimum wage and their, their schedule, because you, you typically have like a target that you try to reach in like three to five years. And then you have an escalation schedule, which will help you ramp up to that target. Cause we can't just take minimum wage from 10 to $20 overnight. Right. Um, so Edgewater's escalation schedule is basically just going to match Denver eventually in a few years. And then Boulder County also just passed a new minimum wage and they're gonna to escalate to $25 by 2030. The blue cities, we don't know what we're doing yet. We're trying to figure that out, which is what the analysis and engagement is supposed to help inform. Yes, can you remind me what, what, the, what it currently is in the city of Boulder? Yeah, so the, the rest of everybody else, including the blue folks are at the state level at 1442. I think I think twenty five dollars um, by twenty thirty twenty five dollars as a minimum wage sounds great, but with twenty thirty being six years away and the cost of living, <laughs> the cost of living having to increase by then, how do you guys determine if it's going to be a wage that's comfortable for people? Is it even going to make a difference? The numbers going up, but is the way people live going to be changing? Right, because if minimum wage goes up and inflation keeps up with yeah, it, exactly. what does it matter? It's a good point. Um, we can only, like the legislation at the state level that even allows us to do anything with minimum wage, because before 2019, do anything. Like the state precluded us from touching minimum wage laws. So now that we can do things, it's very conditionally. Um, the state says you can, but you can't raise it more than 15% in any given year. So we're capped at how much. Mm -hmm. um, it, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly what Boulder's escalation schedule is, but you can only go so high so fast, basically. Mm -hmm. These are the questions that we ask during focus groups. There's a there's a whole questionnaire like I had shared um, at that at that link. And they have a lot of more like close ended questions about how much do you make, where do you live, things like that. Um, these are our open form feedback questions that we're asking in the focus group. So a lot of these are very dialogue rich, conversation based types of feedback that um, we will be analyzing shortly. The engagement numbers are actually 438 questionnaire responses as of right now, because I just checked. Um, and we have 50 participants in focus group sessions from Boulder, but 40 um, participants have been participating in Longmont so far. So 90 so far between our two cities. And here is a high level timeline that we've put together. 
This just shows the different tracks of work that we're looking at. As you can see, there's the consultant analysis that's happening right now. There's the session sessions and questionnaire that is also happening right now. Um, we're gonna report findings and seek direction. Um, one of those reports is gonna be at your meeting um, June 18th. So we'll come back and we'll let you know um, what are the results of what we heard uh, as well as city council in July. Um, there's going to be another chance for public comment when we do go to city council, assuming that public hearings and ordinance and things like that happen, there will be the, the normal public comment period that people have. Um, and if we get direction from council to draft an ordinance, we will, you know, have that happen and communicate the decision. But um, it is still uncertain at this point if all five councils or, or any of them really will say, go forth and draft an ordinance. I think that's my last slide. So I, that was really jumbled, sorry. I, is there any questions? First question I have for you is, you said you talk to businesses and employees, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, what kind of feedback do you get between the two? Like, is it both positive or is it some of them? Yeah, so the whole bit. Um, there's a lot of folks that are very compassionate to the affordability challenges that we have in the community right now. Um, and, and some folks on that side of compassion with the community are like, yeah, raise minimum wage, like definitely got to get it up there. But there are some folks that highlight just the challenges of, of being in the business of, of owning a business. And um, there's a lot of different things, property taxes going up, healthcare. Um, being a big issue, I, I've heard actually from several folks, well, if I didn't have to pay for health care, like, of course, I'd love to pay more, but like health care costs so much. Um, and they're just, the margins are getting slimmer and slimmer, especially for industries like restaurants. So um, they're very apprehensive about this. Um, they also, if a decision is going to happen, would like to know sooner rather than later because they start budgeting for their next year. Um, around the summer time frame. So a heads up sooner rather than later would be good. Uh, but it's it's really mixed reviews. Well, my question, I understand you guys want to raise the minimum wage, you know, it's a good thing. And I do believe it's, you know, but one thing I, I'm just gonna you know, throw it at you so you can think about it too, that could make it better. We, you know, because as a business owner, I'm speaking it that way. You know, like, you, know, you guys can give us a tax break too. <laughs> like, because the fair of it is, it's crazy. Like, you raise it, we're going to have to figure out a way to pay what you guys come out with. Mm -hmm. As a, if it's an ordinance, we will call it. But when you look at it, nothing goes down for us. Like, as a business owner, like, so healthcare stays the same, the taxes change. So, my whole thing is if there's a strategy, if it works, you guys can think. Because Boulder has high tax, like it's pretty high. So I'm just going it so at least everybody can have a soft move when they move into it. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I was wondering, are you doing any kind of targeted outreach for feedback from um, students, both high school and college students? who often, you know, engage in these minimum minimum wage jobs, particularly as they're thinking about it and gearing up for the summer. So we are part of our strategy of outreach where we're going in person to, to businesses and talking to employees and, and all, all sorts of folks. Um, it includes the Hill, um, but I, I have to talk to my engagement professional. Her name's Angela. Um, she's been doing a tremendous job of contacting um, so many organizations. I, I'm not even confident I have a whole list in my head. So I'll have to ask her about schools um, and make sure that we've we've made outreach to them. Yeah, yeah. It just seems like it would be a good demographic to hear from. Definitely. No, absolutely. And the, the question of emancipated minors does come up in the legislation and it has come up um, in conversation. You know, on one hand, I think a lot of folks make the assumption that unemancipated minors a lot of the time they're in jobs to get spending money to go to the mall and things like that um there's also the argument that 
there are many miners that make serious contributions to family wealth building. Um, so it's taking all of these truths um, together and trying to make a generalized decision on behalf of the community amidst a lot of very um, different opinions and experiences. So the more the more feedback that we get, the better we can sort of understand um, what the impact of those decisions will be. Could you just clarify what emancipated minors mean? Oh, um, unemancipated minors are children that are still in the custody, if you will, of parents. Um, some sometimes kids can become emancipated from their parents. Normally, kids at the age of like 16, 17. So they're legally adults as a status, even though they're only 16 or 17. Um, unemancipated minors are just like regular kids, if you will. <laughs> kids still with their family. Legal right? guardians. Yeah. With, yeah, legal, their parents having legal authority over them. I have one more question. Um, are there any studies being looked at of just regionally what's happening to labor patterns sort of since 2019 when we have uneven minimum wages across the greater Denver metro area and the, if, if, if like businesses who are currently um you know like here in Boulder where we're at 14 whatever it is we're seeing neighboring areas that have higher minimum wages like we're seeing more challenges in hiring that I don't know if, he, like, for example, right, Denver raised their wage. Yeah. So does that make us less competitive as, yeah. like, an employment market? Um, I don't know of any reports on that. The Colorado Department of Labor and Employment does put out a report every year. It's called the Local Minimum Wage Report. Mm -hmm. And it includes um, special analysis for any cities that have raised minimum wage. So Denver's in there. Edgewater and Boulder County will be in there this year. Um, about Boulder County, right? In particular, unincorporated Boulder right. County, right? But but it's still like our neighborhoods, and in some cases, it's a matter of just crossing a street where somebody might find a higher paying job on that side of the street as opposed to the other side, and if that what kind of effect that might have. Right, which is what makes this conversation so relevant. I mean, I, I have, to your point, JH um, had several conversations with people being like, well, you know, I can't really afford that. Um, what I have heard several folks say is, well, we also have to remain competitive with our Metro partners. You know, maybe not 25, but like we have to be competitive with Denver. So there might be points of agreement um, that, that we find in the engagement feedback once we actually analyze it all. And I'm not just like recalling some things from memory. Um, but the there there is a report that CDLE. I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you speak a little bit slower? Oh, sorry. thank you. <laughs> there is a report that CDLE, Colorado Department of Labor and Employment, puts out every year. Um, but it's pretty limited in what they look at. They look at folks' um, earnings. Um, they look at businesses and um, uh, I'm sorry, local tax sales tax revenue, um, which is what part of why we're doing a third party analysis with a consultant is because the consultant is going to do a much um, more granular impact analysis of our, our specific region. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I'm way over on time. <laughs> I want to just remind you that in your packet to you have the PowerPoint presentation that uh, Taylor um, Tended to to share it with you all tonight with the information and links. Um, but I'm sorry. I was just going to suggest um, that we screen share what the survey looks like. So Taylor, so Ingrid and I are are both working with Taylor and other um, city staff to help do the outreach to businesses and community members. And one of the things that Taylor has shared with speaking with businesses is that sometimes people will say, um, well, let me just tell you right now, it's like, ah, ah, da, 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 da. We, need, uh, we need to have all the input to be sure we're recording it kind of appropriately in the survey. And we hope that you all will take this yourself because you're members of this community um, it is available in English and Spanish again, but just wanted to maybe just show you 
what um, what it's like. It's not very long, and it's really just kind of checking checking boxes. Yeah. Um, so if you are employed, where do you work? Which of the following describes your work situation? And you can select multiple for some of these. Um, which best describes your job? What is your hourly wage range? If you have more than one job, what is that range? Um, which statement best describes your opinion? And these, these are actually, so the engagement, remember that timeline? We have the engagement process, but then the consultant analysis. Um, there are ways that those two processes inform each other. And this question is, is one example of that. Um, the, the scenarios that you see there are all being forecasted by the consultant as, as part of their scope of work. And so um, we're going to we're going to see a little bit of a look into the future, kind of, because you can't really do that um, from the consultant. And then based on the feedback of folks' opinion, we're also going to be able to combine that. Um, are you participating in any, any of the engagement sessions just to let folks know that those are available. And then this one, um, do you identify as a business owner or someone that employs people? And then there's a couple more questions on the next slide, but if you just wanted to do that, that would be fine too. So you could, you could stop it at eight. Um, well, that was all, that was all. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. You. So hopefully that's helpful just to kind of see it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to follow up with the links to the surveys both um, languages and also a flyer that we had with the upcoming events that are coming. Um, I think the next one is next week, I believe so. Yes. Um, so do you, if you wanna attend or share those with community members that you have uh, contact with, please do so. Yeah, I actually forgot to grab them, but there's flyers right over there. Before I leave, I'll pop in and I'll drop some off. Um, we've been hanging them on bulletin boards and coffee shops and giving them out to people. Um, I'll leave a stack. So if you want to take a couple to wherever you go, but we want to hear from everybody. Um, people who work, people who employ people, students, retirees, anybody. Basically, if you're not an infant, we would like to know your opinion. <laughs> you should also probably like know what infants think about this because it impacts them too. <laughs> yeah. Really, yeah. So I see, uh, may I ask one last question, is that okay? I see on your slide, you mostly look at restaurants. What kind of business do you, have you been in touch with? Like restaurant, supermarket, uh, like you know, grocery stores? Yeah, um, small grocery stores like Carnesarias, um, nail salons, a lot of nail salons. What? And uh, several smoke shops actually. Um, they've just been like in between all of the businesses. So I, you know, kind of hit them too. Um, uh, <laughs> oh, that was good. Um, dry cleaners and uh, went to Boulder Shelter for the Homeless today. That's not a, a business, but dropped off some flyers there. Um, and all sorts of other like massage studios, health and wellness places, tattoo shops. Mostly the small businesses of Boulder. Because I think that's, yeah, that can be an issue that was between small and big. I think it's big, you know. Sorry. Uh, I think it could be, sorry. I think it's a big issue between small and big business because the competition is, I think it's pretty hard. And I think that's why I think maybe if you could look at the big businesses and small as well, because that might make a, open a whole new area for, for what you guys are doing. Maybe like, is that what I'm trying to say to you is like, there are some big business that's all established. They can pay certain minimum wage. Some small businesses, there's no way. And they can compete. So that's all I'm talking about. Thanks, guys. Taking a lot of your time. Good time. And I'll be back. Yep. Um, now we're moving into the staff. Okay. We have another item there. Which um, one? Is police oversight. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, I can. Yeah, next time I will. It's mine. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so no my item so um police oversight panel fellow is that correct yeah um that is correct you got um i can give just the overview of um when we met with jh and carlos uh to set up the agenda both of them posed a few questions that um, I sent to um, the chair and, and vice chair of the police oversight panel. Those answers were in your packet. Um, and this is a time for you if you want to share what those questions were, the answers, it's a time for you to discuss amongst your, um, yourselves uh, and follow up on it. Oh, great. I have to go back to it because I can't start counts. Um, I think that my, what I asked was uh, who was elected on that, and then uh, I don't remember exactly, but I have to go back to it if I can go back to it. So, go ahead, Carol. I had a question reading for you, but I ask you. Uh, yeah, at the end of that meeting, there were three uh, main questions. I'm happy to pull up the packet and um, uh, read them. Uh, let me just pull it up real quick. Do any of you need, do you just need more, maybe more time to kind of read what was in the packet? And then you can talk about it later too. If That's you're not prepared to do that tonight, it's totally fine. Okay. It's your no, no. That's fine. Um, you can also take a break if you want to to then kind of yeah, resume yeah. the conversation, or you can move it to a different break. Um, to a different time as well. Well, the break calls. Mm -hmm. The break will be good. Okay. Great. Great. So um, we're ten minutes past our meeting time. We did start it late. Um, oh. A little bit, like 17 minutes late, but um, so I'll go ahead and pause the video and we will be back. I'll go to What's the week? Thank you. Welcome back from your break. Okay. Um, so you took a break in a pause to reassess um, and review the packet for a minute and decide whether you want to move forward and have this conversation amongst yourself right now about the questions that you pose to the police oversight panel, chair and vice chair, and the answers that you got. So Please. Okay. Oh. Here, Carlos, you can. Um, you can choose to whatever you choose to do. Or do you want to go ahead and discuss them right now or revisit uh, at a later meeting? I think we are going to take uh, we're going to choose uh, to talk in the next meeting about this. May I just make one suggestion before we close this item? Sure. Um, I have found that oftentimes when I want to have a better understanding of the situation, it it's, can be very helpful just to have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with somebody and that you may all want to consider just reaching out to the, to the chair or other new members of the police oversight panel um, to have a better understanding of what's going on. Um, you know, we have a new, we have several new members of the police oversight panel, and I've already seen in the last week some news about their concerns again, that people have been meeting with certain civil society groups or the NAACP, and it feels to me that 
things are getting politicized again. And I feel like the HRC has a really good opportunity to be a check against the politicization of a lot of this going on, um, that you may want to consider inviting members of the police oversight panel to come to our meeting and have a talk instead of doing it over email and having it be about procedures, or that some of you may want to actually go to a police oversight panel meeting and see what it's all about. I think that can be a, often a faster way to understand the complexities of the situation. So that would just be my suggestion as you think about this in the future. Thank you, Christine. Um, yeah, I think I agree with what Christine said, and I think um, the other thing would be like you describe on your letter is uh, is all wool and stuff like that, like you know more. But I think yes, I did. I put some notes in about that, and I feel like I'm not really prepared, and I think it's better to talk about it in a different meeting. And I think I will. Definitely um, apply that to meet with you know and one and one, and that's probably will be more helpful instead of uh, doing by email. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we you can move into the next item. Let's start from there. Sure. And now we're moving on to the staff updates. Great. Uh, thank you. So as you are aware, um, the Human Relations Commission elections um, and appointments occurred last week by City Council. And um, there were two newly appointed HRC members, um, our mayor, and Emily uh, Locker for the terms that you see on the screen. Aaron will be uh, Wes appointed for a five-year term and Emily for a two-year term. As you all have been through, they're gonna go through a onboarding process, both with um, the city clerk's office and as well with um, city staff. With us and the onboarding packet will be sent to them. And um, I did attach the appointments link to the city council meeting that occurred on March 14th. If you want to revisit that appointment, and they will be sworn in at next month's meeting and joining uh, the commission. We are so thankful for Christine's and Anna's contributions to that commission. Um, I know that um, Christine, you were in the commission for three years total and um, your contributions have been amazing. Anna was appointed for one term year last year and it has come to a conclusion. So thank you, Anna, for your time as well with the commission. Um, that is the update on the commission elections and new members. Um, I would like to highlight that in the past, usually the chair or vice chair meet with new um, HRC members to kind of get them up to speed and part of a warmer welcoming that again has to happen one-on-one. -on -one. And I just wanna uh, pose that possibility because you have the chance to do that if you choose to do it. You don't have to make a vote or choose it right away. Uh, you can just establish that conversation uh, mm -hmm. later on. Do you have anything to add, Elizabeth, to um, that item? Uh, not about the new members. I'll reserve some comments at the end for our two. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, the other update that I would like to give you is related to the Human Relations Fund. This is an item that we also provided an update last month. And I would like to remind you that the second application round is going to be, uh, is going to open really soon, the first week of April. And I encourage you to share this opportunity with community members and organizations that are community led who might be interested in applying for the funds. Um, these funds will be available for events happening between um, 
the second um, part of the year, which is from June to December, 2024. All of the information in the application uh, will be and is available online. Um, I would like also to share with you that for the first half of the year, events that happen between January as of May of 2024, nine groups of agencies were granted funds uh, for seven different events. You have listed here a few of the organizations that were granted funds, and that includes Orlando, BIMOCA, uh, La Vecindad, also known as Michantli, Boulder Corral, Motor Theater, NWACP, the Museum of Boulder, and the Second Baptist Church. Go ahead. What is uh, Michante? I don't know that group. Michante is a movement dance sanctuary, is how they define it. It is located on 30th and um, 30th mm -hmm. and Arapaho shopping mall area. They do have um, all sorts of dance classes. Is the space that is open for youth, uh, where and young adults. Um, I don't I don't know that it's limited in terms of age. I know that they also practice dance and cultural dances, hip hop and others. Um, yeah, is is one of those groups, smaller organizations that started applying for funds, I believe, last year. Great. Yeah. Very impressive. Yes. Young yeah, people actually, and those yeah. who are young at heart. <laughs> <laughs> I know that the owner also paints, no? Mm -hmm. That is correct. There's a lot of talent um, in our community at large and uh, in this specific group as well. Before we leave the Human Relations Fund, just wanted to note, and um, Speaker, I didn't connect with you ahead of, ahead of time, but we when we went through that process to kind of remove this grant making function from the HRC and embed it within our human um, human services investments team, which is led by um, Jalia Daly and Markeisha Keehagan. Um, Beaker was kind of offered to be a representative from the Human Relations Commission to help review grant applications and make those decisions. I know it's been a lot of, you've had some challenges with just kind of time and scheduling. Mm -hmm. So just want to kind of bring that up. We have other city staff members, um, Ingrid and one of our colleagues, Barb um, Baca, who does not otherwise work in, you know, kind of on these issues at all, helping review applications and making decisions. But just wanted to lift that up and that one of the, um, the structure that we put in place was that the HRC could have someone um, help review these applications. And Fika just wanted to empower you to say like, if you want to, like, is this going well? Is it something you want to keep doing? Do you feel like you need to, you know, see if somebody else wants to? Um... Yeah, I spoke with Adelia, who uh, I don't really speak with my too much, but Adelia and Ingrid and said that it was just so hard to, so hard to fit it into the schedule and have a time for us to meet. And so I would uh, uh, really appreciate it if someone else would be able to take on that role. I know the two new members aren't here right now. So I know I'm only talking to two people who already have taken on an, another role with the HRC, but maybe when our two new members come on, it, it can be something that we can discuss. For sure. Yeah. yeah. And the time, <laughs> The time, uh, I can speak a little bit about the time requirements or in just in terms of general capacity is uh, when the um, application cycle opens, right? Mm -hmm. is, when, is when the bulk of the work is and it's reading the application which has been simplified to the max as of you may recall from uh, previous application processes. So I think both grantees and um, uh, staff also appreciate the fact that it's a much simpler process, um, including the reviewing team, just so that the application is not too long and it doesn't take a lot of time for grading. And then the, the committee, the reviewing committee meets and compares results of those uh, grading skills. 
And from there, the suggestions on um, funding come, come, come through. Um, so we will provide maybe more specifics about that once the new, two, the two new members come on board. Um, so you can decide amongst yourself who would like to be part of that process. Thank Any you. questions? Yeah. Any questions about the Human Relations Fund? No questions. Great. Okay. The um, next staff update is regarding our city attorney's office and um, the uh, delegated. Um, staff member who works with Housing and Human Services. As you know, we're housed under Housing and Human Services. And um, uh, did you all recall when uh, during our last retreat and several retreats and throughout the history, the most recent history of the HRC, Lucas Markley was the um, attorney that used to be, you know, that connection with the city attorney's office and will come and provide guidance to the commission. Lucas took a different um, and exciting opportunity at a sister municipality and he's no longer with the city. Um, however, um, Roberto Ramirez joined the city um, early on this year. And uh, this is a picture of him and I will share a little bit about him and um, who he is. And if you wish at a later date, make that connection. Maybe once new members come on board, um, you can always invite him to have a conversation and get to know each other. So uh, Roberto Ramirez is Boulder's new deputy city attorney. He is also a Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Air Force Reserves and a federal judge on the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals. As a civilian, he has been the head of litigation for the city of Arvada and has been a state judge as well. In the Air Force, he has worked legal issues as an Air Force federal prosecutor, criminal defense counsel, trial consult, or instructor of the Okinawa, Japan, mainland Japan, South Korea, Africa, Guam, Singapore, Australia, Diego Garcia, which is the Indian Ocean, Colombia, Greenland, Mexico, Hawaii, Colorado, California, New Mexico, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Arkansas, <laughs> North Carolina, Florida, Georgia, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C. All 50 states. <laughs> yeah, I it hasn't. <laughs> Isn't it that impressive? Yeah, that's... <laughs> Roberto is also a Marshall Fellow, where he traveled to Belgium, Germany, France, <laughs> Switzerland, Greece, and Bosnia. Needless to say, we are extremely lucky that Roberto is part of the city of Boulder and a resource to the Human Relations Commission. Um, he is also uh, bilingual. Uh, I wouldn't be amazed if he speaks more than one language that is not listed on his bio, uh, but I wanted to make sure you are up to date with our staff uh, changes and the fact that we are in amazing hands. Thanks, Ingrid. You're welcome. Our next step update is Elevate Boulder. And um, I'll go ahead and um, ask Elizabeth to provide us with that update. Yeah. Um, so yes, JH and Carlos um, had requested that we um, provide another update on this project. Um, we've shared with you about it several times in the past year and, and happy to do so. It is a pilot project that we are, the city is funding with some of our COVID-19 uh, American Rescue Plan Act funds. 
um, three million actually in total of the city's investment from that um, in progress. from that um, from those funds. And we're doing this again because we know how many challenges there are with people who are living in this community with low income and direct cash assistance um, that is not that is unconditional and unrestricted, which means we know you don't have enough money, we're going to give you money and we're not gonna tell you what you have to do with that. We're not gonna tell you, you can only spend it on food or you can only spend it on rent or you can only spend it on healthcare. It's up to you because we trust that individuals and families know their needs better than anyone else. Um, it's a process that has been already um, tested and that is in place in more than 30 communities all over the country. Um, some have just been pilot projects that have started and then ended. Um, others are going on for many, with the hopes of them lasting for many, many years. Um, this is a pilot project. So right now we do not have um, plans in place to continue after 20, 2026 when the funds need to be expended or spent. Um, however, we hope that it is a project that when it proves successful, we'll be able to continue. So just have a few things on this slide. Um, again, just as a reminder for um, how we got to this place. Um, the project was open to for people to apply um, back in the fall um, from kind of November through, um, nope, sorry, from October um, through November. And people needed to be um, residents of the city of Boulder, um, be at least 18 years of old age, um, had to have experienced negative impacts from COVID-19, which was pretty much everybody. Um, and then have income, household income between 30 to 60% of the area median income. And again, it's kind of a complicated formula, um, but it the numbers are different depending on where you live and how many people are in your are in your household. Um, but those were the eligibility criteria. In terms of the process, um, we had um, back in January 2023 nine community members um, who applied to and, and were part of the community task force um, that helped identify those eligibility criteria and just other um, key kind of program or project elements like how much money are people going to receive and for how long and how often. And um, we also worked very closely, not only with that task force, but also a number of nonprofit organizations in the community, particularly um, organizations that serve our low income population that are also led by the people who they're serving. So a Latino organization that's led by Latinos and serving Latinos or led by people who um, are identify as as LGBTQ who are serving that population. So a number of those organizations, and then many more who helped spread the word and, and make sure people were aware of this opportunity. Um, after all the applications came in, um, we one of our consultants um, went ahead and did a selection by random lottery. That was not anything that staff participated in. Nobody kind of went through and said, you're in. You're not. It was a, a random lottery process. How many applicants were there? Um, well over a thousand. And we had from that selected um, 200 based on the criteria. After people were selected, we had a review process to make sure that everyone who was selected was eligible. Um, unfortunately, with programs like this, where People could apply from their homes, right? You didn't have to come in person. We have to just make sure that people are who they say they are. And unfortunately, but expected, there were some people who were not who they said they were or just reported um, uh, information that meant they were not eligible. They didn't live in the city. Um, that was mostly the case. Um, 
And fortunately, um, and by design, um, the system that we use to collect applications enabled people to us to go in and be able to see whether or not somebody was submitting accurate information or not. So that turned out to be very helpful. Um, in the end, um, people who were selected and kind of approved, we were able to verify that their information was correct. Um, they then moved on to an enrollment process. Um, and they, we had 200 people uh, successfully enroll. And they started receiving payments of $250. So receiving those payments twice per month, just like you would a paycheck, um, started on January 15. So the program has been, um, payments have been going out every, you know, twice a month um, since January 15. And that will continue through January 2026. So if you go to the next slide, um, JH and Carlos were specifically kind of interested in knowing a little bit more information about who, who are the participants. Um, one thing I'll share again is that um, the names of the people who are participating in this project are not public. Uh, we have no intention of doing that. Um, people had the opportunity to um, indicate whether or not they wanted to be part of an evaluation process, like filling out a survey um, or coming to a focus group meeting or potentially um, engaging in storytelling for people who wanted to share their story about how this process is, is impacting them. That is completely up to them. We are not requiring anyone to, to share their story. Um, but there are a number of people who did say they want to or they want the opportunity. And so we'll be continuing to um, work with them to, to just see how they want to do that. Um, there are a lot of other, um, there are many examples for how that happens or takes place for other pilot projects in the country. Um, everything from just kind of sharing a, a photo or a story or a quote and a website to um, projects like in um, St. Paul, Minnesota, where people who are receiving direct cash assistance are artists and people have put together dance performances, poetry readings, narratives, murals, all sorts of really creative ways to express um, this opportunity. So um, we're still kind of working on what that might look like and what opportunities will make available to people um, who participate if, if they want to do that. Um, but one of the things that um, JH and um, Carlos were interested in is just without revealing anyone's identities, kind of who are the people who are participating in the project. Um, so this, uh, what you see on the screen is from the kind of the dashboard that is within the application system. Um, and so what you can see, and unfortunately, I'll read these out on my screen. I can hover over the, the circles and it'll tell me percentages, but I couldn't replicate that on this screen. Um, but of the people who were selected, 65% um, of them uh, who applied identified as women, seven or 3.5% identified as transgender, 30% um, identified as male, and then two people identified as, as kind of the other option. They didn't want to say. For um, race and ethnicity, 45.5% um, of participants identified as Hispanic or Latino. 34% are white. 7% Asian. 4.5% identified as Black or African American. 6.5 as multi-race, 1% um, um, American Indian, and these might not be the terms that we would use, their census terminology, and then three people chose not to identify. 15% of the people who applied identified as having a disability, and that could be, they they chose, you know, they, they would know what they mean, but that in our minds can include people that have a physical disability, perhaps a, a mental, um, uh, uh, developmental or intellectual disability, 
anything. So it was up to them to check yes or no. We didn't ask for any of those details. Um, the household size is the, the bar um, graph on the right. And that indicates that, I have to put my glasses back on. Um, starting with the pink bar, I know it's a little bit hard to read on the left. Thank you, Ingrid. That is um, represents the number of people. So 35 people are just a one person household, um, but most of the rest of the um, uh, applicants, as you can see, combined um, are in house, a household of two or more people. We had two people um, who are receiving the uh, direct cash assistance have a, a household of seven and we didn't ask for any more than seven people. So there might've been some <laughs> more. Um, one thing that I think is really um, what we know about these kinds of programs is that if you are in a, where you have two or more people in your household, and especially if there are children in the household, it's the adult who is obviously receiving the funding, but everybody benefits. And this is what I, one of the things that I find really exciting about this is that um, there are 149 of the 200 applicants um, have children in their household. And if you add the number of children who are in those households together, we have 272. So in addition to 200 individuals receiving the direct cash assistance, there's almost 300 more people in the city who are automatically and directly benefiting because they're, they're children living in that household. When we think about um, um, the challenges that children have, if you are in a family that might lose its housing or where your family can't pay for utilities or can't pay for transportation or enough food, um, this is also where that matters, right? So when children are able to be in a household that um, where their basic needs are met, that impacts everything else in their lives from education to, to health to many other indicators. So we're just really, um, I think that's exciting to see, right? So we just know there's automatically many more people who are directly benefiting. Um, we will be conducting surveys, as I mentioned a minute ago, um, for people who selected that option. Um, many people did choose to participate in uh, evaluation through surveys. If they selected that option, when they enrolled in the program, they filled out um, a baseline survey with just all sorts of questions about about them and you know what their ability was to pay for basic needs, for food, questions about mental health, because we know that that in physical health, we know that's a huge, um, can be really hugely affected by, again, whether you have enough money in your household to take care of your needs. And um, so we are working with a consultant who's helping with that evaluation process. The next time that we'll be surveying people who indicated they wanted to be was is in August. So that's kind of like the next um, milestone at which we'll have more information to see at that point how people are reporting, like how is your life sorry, how is your life different um, based on before and after? And then we'll do another survey um, in the second year just to ask them some of the same questions. So we don't have anything really to report on like, how's it going? Um, typically it takes a little bit <laughs> for, you know, for you to really start seeing impacts. Um, although um, every time that we, the system automatically sends the funds out to people, we do have a number of people who just write in to our customer service um, um, portal. And we'll say things like, can I share my story? I want to tell you something. Who can, is there something I can do? Like, is there something I can do to volunteer, to help? Like, I just want to be able to contribute more. This is helping me so much. And we say, no, you don't need to do that. Like, we're, we're going to be happy to take your story when you want to share. But this is unrestricted funds. There's no obligation. Um, but I, to me, that's just reflective of people are just you know, like really excited and, and want to share. Um, 
So that's kind of what I have to share now. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, one more thing, I know like there are always people, including among our task force members, um, city staff, people who would say, um, uh, I know somebody, you know, who's participating and I'm like, oh, it's okay. They, it's up for them to share their story, but they don't have to. Um, but at the same time, if you know people are just here questions in the community about people who heard about it, not quite sure what it means. Um, we are always here. Um, please feel free. You know, you know us, you know me. Um, just ask them, they can reach out anytime. Um, my name is on the city webpage. We'll continue to post information about the program um, as we have it. Um, thank you for doing that. Mm -hmm. I think one of the questions I asked when we were preparing is um, I mean, I was just checking it. So how do you the numbers that like you ever compared to the US census for same income range and voter? So um I don't have the, our our census data open right now to so definitely get back to you on that. But just looking at one thing like well, I have a couple of different examples for what we know and then what we don't know. Um so race and ethnicity is actually if we just look at the city of Boulder, this is a an extremely more diverse group of people um, than the city as a whole. It is more representative of the diversity we have among our low income population, um, but certainly happy to compare that. As if we just look at the city, all city residents, I believe are like our, um, the percentage of community members who identify as Hispanic or Latino is around 9%. I don't know if you, does that seem about right? Ish, nine to 11% maybe. And so in this case, we have almost half of the people in the program who applied and, and then were randomly selected were represent that group. Um, for our black and African-American population, I think it's um, closer, but it, it is more kind of a, a more people in this pool of, of participants than in the general population. Disability is really tricky, um, right? Because there's some information that people collect um, about disabilities. Like if you um, have benefits, like medical benefits because you're on disability, we have some of that information is available. But there are many, many um, disabilities that are called invisible disabilities. So somebody who has a brain injury or a learning disability or um, experiences um, a form of autism. Those are like, we, we just don't have good information on that. We connected with organizations like um, the Center for People with Disabilities um, to help us kind of assess like, what, how should we conduct outreach to make sure we're getting people that represent all populations, including people with disabilities. Um, and we had them as a partner organization so that if somebody wanted to apply, but they have a disability and they needed some extra assistance, they were there, you know, to help them with the process. And that was the same thing with people with um, other languages, particularly Spanish and Nepali although we had people who needed help in other languages and we have a language line. So overall, we tried to make sure that it was not only a inclusive process, but also a dignified process where people felt like they um, had the information that they needed in the way that they needed it to be able to understand and, um, and go through the process. I strayed from your question, but hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> but yeah, we can do, you know, like a more of a side by side comparison. Um, gender identity is another one that's a little bit tricky because we don't always ask people. We don't want to be invasive. Some people choose, they're like, I don't want to tell you <laughs> how I identify, and that's okay. You don't have to. Um, but we work with Out Boulder County. Um, for example, to try to understand, like, how should we, you know, make sure that we're um, reaching as broad a population as possible? Thank you. Any other questions or comments about Elevate Boulder? 
Why do you think that Brian or what is the question? Answer all the questions that I have. Uh, uh, with this, I think when people ask me, I can give an answer now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I should say that we, um, I will admit, in our, if our communications colleague is listening, she'll say, mm -hmm. I owe her some <laughs> information to update one of the web pages. If we may not put these graphs on exactly because again they don't show percentages. Um, it's also just really hard. It's not our city dashboard. There are a lot of dashboards on our web, the city website, but we don't kind of. Um, it's through another website, and it's I just cut and pasted and stuck it on a you know slide. But we'll probably um, have information on the website that just kind of gives some of the examples of the percentages of you know who the who the participants are and could do some comparisons you know for Pete if that's helpful to kind of the general population so that's coming it's on my list <laughs> I will just highlight that it will be important not only to stay tuned for um, listening to those impactful stories uh, and testimonies of how um, the program has impacted the participants, but also the continuation and potential continuation of the program later on, right? Um, which we'll see more and learn more as <laughs> the consultants um, assess the program and share results and. It's a long process of presenting it to city officials and et cetera, but it's, it's a pilot project and uh, I just invite you to stay tuned. And if any of you are interested, um, there are several, there are, as I mentioned, there are projects all over the country. Um, there's another very large um, project in Denver um, called the Denver Basic Income Project. They have a very um, robust, I would even say com complex, research evaluation program where they're giving some people a certain amount of money and another group of people a different amount so they can really compare among people receiving money who, how the impacts are different. We're not doing that kind of very, very deep, broad research because it's been done already in many other places um, but there are other programs just right in our region um, that are also doing this um, strategy and, and they're looking at expanding and extending the project there great um, any questions comments no well we can move on into the next agenda item um, oh, human trafficking. Yeah, I still have That's one true. item to go over, which is human trafficking mm -hmm. um, trainings that are coming up. I thought I had a slide here, but I'm not seeing it. Right there. Oh, here it is. Okay. Right. So um, I wanted to share with you a learning opportunity for you as a commission and anyone who's interested. There are um, um, community trainings that are happening in our region. I happened to attend a one in Longmont over a month ago. Um, these um, trainings are on human trafficking and um, the training is very comprehensive on a more um, updated um, concept of what human trafficking means in our country, in, in this country. Um, and they're hosted by the Laboratory to Combat Human Trafficking and the District Attorney's Office. There is an upcoming training on April 3rd from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. If you want to and can attend, that's the QR code that will take you to the signing, uh, to the sign up form where you can learn more about um, this training specifically. Because a number of city staff members were able and invited to attend to that training in Longmont, which by the way, was open to the entire community. And there were materials circulating, circulating around. Um, 
we are hoping to, in organizing, to host a series of sessions coming up this summer. Um, this is in collaboration with um, the City of Boulder Office of Equity and Belonging and our, the Office of Human Rights. Uh, and we will be able to share more information with you about those upcoming sessions and opportunities in summer. We're hoping to have a variety of options um, and invite people who are interested in learning more about it. This is part of a national campaign that has amazing materials in several languages. It's really uh, rich and um, the people who facilitate the training also are very well versed on a specific region problematic areas. So it is very relevant to the work of the Human Relations Commission. And I'll invite you to participate and if you're able on April, April 3rd and um, or attend to any of the summer sessions. Just one thing. Uh, can you make uh, the sessions in the afternoon because 10 to 11 30 is a little difficult for me that time yeah i understand and this is not a session that we put together it's a session that is available right now that is being coordinated in partnership with other agencies including the district attorney's office we will be contemplating um dates and times that are more suitable to and you know accessible to community yes. members that we we yeah or maybe a same thing yes weekends or um evenings yeah that's something that we strive to do um even in um when we hosted the um a recent series on migrant rights uh we were hosting those here in this building during Saturday mornings and there's one that is coming up at some point as well. Um, so yes, thank you for making that um, suggestion. We will absolutely take that into account. Thank you. Well, no way I get the update information of the other. I'm sorry, what? May I get this information to Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we will make it available on our website and uh, since you're exiting the Human Relations Commission, I would just encourage you to stay in touch and, and um, listen and stay in touch with your peers as well. Uh, but we will make it, you know, as accessible as possible for the entire community to be aware that these sessions are available. Anything else? No? Okay. I will share the, um, the slides. Um, so you can have also access to the QR code and the information that is included here. Um, but we can move on into the next agenda item, which is actually commissioner's updates before following up, close and closing. So did you have updates? I've got a few. <laughs> Um, so a uh, couple things. One, I think I, I mentioned earlier, I met with a couple members of city council. Um, it was uh, Lauren Fulterix and Tara, Tara Weiner um, to talk about the need for board and commission reform. And um, they were they were wonderful. They were, you know, we, we had coffee and they kind of listened to what I had to say. Um, both of them are former board and commission members themselves. And so what, what they told me was that what I was raising was something that they're seeing across multiple boards and commissions. And they, um, you know, they recognize that there's a whole group of people who are very willing to volunteer their time and energy to help with the city and um, that the system is not really working as, as it should. So, um, I believe I believe you know, they have various subcommittees on city council, and I believe they are the ones who are assigned to look at boards and commissions. So, uh, so I just wanted to let you all know about that. Um, and I also, when I sent my resignation letter, I heard from um, 
most of the city council emailed me back individually just to say that they they heard the message and they agreed um, that there were issues. But I I I my takeaway from this um, is that they're all very open and willing to hear from us. Although interestingly, I, I think it sometimes is more effective to do so as an individual commissioner than through formal channels. Um, and so that door is open to all of you. Um, and I will also say that um, I believe in the three years that I've been on this commission, there are only two members of city council now who were also part of city council then. So there is a whole new group of people, including all the new members who were elected in November. And they themselves are in the middle of trying to learn about how all this works. Um, so I just say this, that if you ever have any issues or concerns you want to raise, um, I do think I would encourage you to reach out to members of city council individually and just have coffee with them and talk. Because I think they're very receptive and that's a good way to sort of elevate issues for future consideration. So um, that's one thing I want to tell you all. Um, the second thing is I had coffee yesterday with one of the new incoming members of the HRC, um, Aaron, uh, is it Nair or Nair? I don't know how it's pronounced. Oh, Nair. Um, uh, you may or may not know, Aaron actually ran for city council um, and was not elected, but he, um, you know, he is gonna, going to take the five year term. And I think he's great. Um, he is, He's young, he's energetic, he has experience working in uh, civil society and on policy issues, and um, he's very excited to join the HRC. And so I just uh, met with him and told him a little bit about my experience on the HRC. I encouraged him to reach out to all of you and to other former members of the HRC. And, um, and so I think, you know, I think you have a, really nice new addition. Um, I have not spoke, spoken to Emily Loker, but um, I did look at her application and I think she also has good policy uh, policy mind. Um, and I also think both of them have connections to the university as well, uh, which I think is also nice because I, I don't think any of us officially in any capacity have connections to the university. So um, I just wanted to let all of you know about that too. Um, and I wanted to thank all of you, too. It's been a very rewarding experience. Um, as I said last month, I have mixed feelings about stepping away, um, but I'm sure I will, you know, we'll stay in touch and there will be other ways in the future where I can get involved. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, Christine. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Any responses, additional comments, additional updates? It's not about Christine, it's about me. I also would like to say thank to be part of give this opportunity to be a part of human relation. Yeah, it was a great experience for me. And I also want to stay in touch. Because yeah, people is great. And we raise a lot of issues. You know, we not like so much meetings with them, but it was great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we can move on into uh, follow up items in closing. Um, I can share uh, what I have listed that I will be following up with, with all of you. So I will um, go ahead and remove the highlighted areas from the uh, letter you have put together to council and submit it. Um, I will also reshare um, the link to minimum wage survey as well as the flyer with the upcoming events. Um, I will also share the slide deck for tonight's meeting. 
so you can have access to the presentations. And I will also add the flyer um, for the upcoming human trafficking event that is happening on April 3rd and keep you posted as uh, in when uh, other sessions uh, are scheduled in the future. They're, those are gonna happen in summer, so yeah. Um, do you have any other follow-up items in I your list? Do you do, just one I think in addition to those is um, so the, when Mark um, Fear gave public comment at the beginning, um, from tenant advisory committee that's another committee that um that the our department our housing and human services department staffs um i will be in touch with the some of our ingrids and my colleagues um who work very closely most closely with that committee um the committee chair and, and mark and others there so we can kind of hear a little bit more about what they um have in mind and just enable more direct communication, additional direct communication um, with them uh -huh. and you around issues that you find mutually um, of mutual interest and in use. I, I think the other comment I would just make on that is that, you know, it, it kind of goes back to what Christine was sharing and the letter that you, I think the letter that you're going to submit to council about um, needing clarity, right, on whose roles are and what scope is. And as staff, regardless of what the board or commission or committee, um, so committees are, are yet another type of particip uh, participatory body. And in, in our department, we have probably, I think, eight or nine committees that help manage our funding programs, the tenant advisory committee, there's an older adult advisory committee, the Youth Opportunities Advisory Board, we've got lots. And so it's just, we we wanna keep eyes on um, making sure that everybody is, re is really as clear as possible on what their role is. Um, otherwise, everybody's kind of doing everything and, and there's less impact to have, right? So I just wanted to share that, is that I think there's always, we wanna foster communication between all the different groups where you want to do that and it doesn't necessarily mean that you are expected to take on all of their issues. In fact, that's probably not a good idea. <laughs> but we're, we'll follow up and just hear a little bit more about what Mark um, has in mind and, you know, for the next meeting, um, see how you want to proceed with that communication. And then um, my other comment is just to, to add on to the thank yous, Christine and to Anna, we will miss you. Um, it's really been a pleasure um, to get to, to work with you, to, to learn from you both, um, and to just help try to be responsive to what you find um, is not only an, an issue in our community, but ones that you are particularly interested about trying to affect change yourselves. Um, we greatly admire you and everyone um, who wants to step into these roles, and thank you very much. <laughs> oh, uh, before I close, uh, also if you can give up the coming events uh, from Pimoca and all those organizations. That... Oh, those are already already happened uh, because those were taking place between January and May. Oh, and are in some the still are still out. Yeah. Uh, I think we no, the second cycle, um, oh, okay. the mm -hmm. upcoming cycle, but some of them go through through May. Oh, so I think there's some that probably haven't happened yet. Okay. Anyway, the um, events are in your spreadsheet, mm -hmm. um, where the events are the, at the bottom. So I'll make sure I update that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, it's all yours. Oh, is it? Uh, can you take a motion to adjourn? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Christine, would you like to take your last motion? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's my honor. Well played. <laughs> I move that we adjourn tonight's meeting.
Uh, 821. Yeah. Didn't know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I'll say hi. 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 Uh, Thank you. That's good. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night.